Center of Being in Iberian Studies program. And uh, really pleased you could all come today. You may have noticed we had a little switch, switch in our schedule at the last minute. And I'm so happy that um, Herman was able to switch out from November to today and help us kind of <laughs> re reformulate our uh, lunchtime lecture series. So um, just wanted to mention, you probably noticed when you came in, but there's coffee and hot water for tea and some snacks in the back, which you're welcome to. We also have a handout of our most up-to-date lecture series schedule um, for the semester that's kind of in that clipboard there. And also a sign-in sheet if you are not on our listserv and you want to be added to get information about our, the, the various events that we are um, sponsoring. So thanks a lot for coming and I'll turn it over to Alberto Vargas to introduce our speaker. Okay. Uh, thank you, thank you, Sarah, and uh, welcome everybody. I'm Alberto Vargas, I'm the Associate Director of the program, Latin American, Caribbean, and Iberian Studies program. And it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Germán Palacio Castañeda. Uh, Germán has uh, hip connections with, with Madison, because he obtained a, a Master in Science in Legal Institutions here from the law school in, um, in 1985. And uh, he also was a Tinker Visiting Professor in 2010. Germán also has a PhD in History from Florida International University. He's a, a professor in the Universidad Nacional de Colombia in the Amazon campus in Leticia, where he has been the director 2001, 2005, and now he's the director of the graduate program, and he was responsible for creating a new program, a doctorate in, in, uh, in Amazonian studies. Uh, he's a prolific writer, he has many publications, a um, uh, couple of uh, edited books, one of them, The Political Ecology in the Amazon, and uh, uh, dozens of, of papers and, and publications, uh, peer review articles, so it's my great pleasure to receive Herman, who's going to talk to us about how Amazonian and Pan-Amazonian is changing with the world. Welcome, Herman. Okay. Thank you, Alberto. Thank you, Sarita. Oh, thank you, all the colleagues of the LASIS program and Francisco, of course. Um, I, I originally I, I thought this uh, lecture as a part of my presentation in, in UNILA. UNILA is a Universidad allí, Federal, Latinoamericana, oh, uh, something that I don't remember exactly that is in Fosdi Guasú, but it's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Universidad Federal de Latinoamérica. So. It's very interesting because there was uh, organized by Lula this time, and half of the professors uh, come from different parts of Brazil, outside of Brazil and half of the students too. So I put together some ideas and what related to the relationship between Amazonia and globalization. So I took this opportunity to improve a little bit and I hope that all the problems that the presentation have you will help me improving with ideas or saying nonsense or whatever <laughs> you, you think is important. So let's start. Um, nowadays, or since the last decades, the global audience used to simplify Amazonia. But Amazonia has been simplified in very different ways. It's a very interesting topic for research for people in literature or the people who study metaphors. But let's say Amazon since the beginning, these women warriors, El Dorado, Lost Paradise, Green Hell, or Red Desert. All of these are metaphors about the Amazon. But in the last two decades or three decades, I would say that there is a global imaginary about the Amazonia with the two particular, um, um, let's say, driving forces that put that kind of metaphor in the mind of everybody in the world. One is the global environmental agenda and the Rio summit in, in 1992. And second, the commemoration of the invasion of contact, or whatever is the name, between Europe and the New World in 19, 1992. Um, I would say that since then, environmentalists, indigenous activists, 
And scholars have realized that it's much more important to understand the Amazonia as a whole, rather than the fragmented Amazonia, fragmented because of the of nation states, is we have in reality a very big, a huge sociobiome. However, the imaginaries are like this. Maybe Avatar is one of the best and interesting and fascinating way to put it. A big, 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 big humid forest and populated with indigenous people. Some indigenous people. I would say that the idea of an hydrological basin, the whole river, was amplified with an ecosystemic vision that make Amazonia a Pan-Amazonia, a big entity. From there emerged a, a vision that um, reinforced ordinary people that are part of this big bio. My point right now is that two decades after this important imaginary that is kind of global, um, there have been happening new things that should be taken in consideration and maybe change a little bit that global imaginary that is in the global public. However, before I keep going, I have to say that fragmented Amazonia has a lot of inertia because of course the existence of nation states, territorial nation states. <coughs> This nation state, despite globalization, not always has been weakened, but some of them have been strengthened, in fact. <clears throat> this is the way, more or less, we can change that. We understand now Amazonia. It's like the big forest, that part that is the India, the Andean Amazonian region, and this southern part that is kind of a little savanna sort of of landscape, but it's anyway big. Some people will move this line through to this point and this point, so even Amazonia could be bigger. For example, the Venezuelan Amazonia, in reality, is that kind of Orinoco landscape that is that has continuity with the Amazonian forest, but from the hydrological point of view, is more like Orinoco. Um, from the smallest Amazon, we are moving to the, com the understanding of a Pan-Amazon region. And I put this, the Amazon River does not start in Manaus, it's because it's kind of common, or, or it was for Brazilians to think that, I'm sorry, to think that Amazonia, Amazonas is that river that is the confluence of Solimoes, they call, what we call in Peru and in Colombia Amazonas, and they call Solimoes, and the, um, the black, let me see where it is, maybe it's this, no, I, I don't see here. Ah, maybe it's this. Yes, this is the Rio Negro, which is calling Colombia Rio Negro and Baubes. <clears throat> In the 19th century, it was very important to think on the Amazon region, on the Amazon River, as part of just one country. It was part of the global dispute between countries like England and the United States, saying, if the river is part just of, of grand con one country, it's an internal river. But if it goes through several countries, that is an international river, and then there should be free trade. So, right now we have a more global, amplified comprehension of what is Amazonia, not so fragmented. Let's take a look to some data. 7. Point million square kilometer, kilometers is almost the United States taking away Alaska. Or it's like Australia. It's kind of huge. It's shared by eight countries, and I didn't call 
the French Guiana country because it's a colony of France, because France is still a colonial power. Protected areas, 23%, indigenous territory, 26 And if you add two of these, it doesn't give you the exact number, just because many of the protected areas, with some sort of environmental uh, principle working on it, it intercepts with resguardos or reservas with reservations of indigenous people. More or less 33 million people live in the Amazon, more than 370 native, uh, different native peoples, 1.7 million indigenous people. So you see it's not a big quantity. Um, 129 indigenous communities in voluntary isolation. That is a concept that is, has been working in the United Nations for a specific uh, group of indigenous people. And more than three, 30 million non-indigenous people. Let's say Urbanai, Pesan, Caboclo, River people, coca growers, and also a lot, of, a lot of bureaucracy in these small towns that live there. More or less to have an idea. I think there are three main drivers that are changing a lot the Amazon, or in a way they are disputing the meaning and the, also the size of the Amazon. Two of them are completely global, and one is more related to uh, the nation state. Two global projects are fighting to put their imprint in the Amazon. One is what I will call conservationism, but I am calling neo-conservationism, later I will tell you why. Neo-developmentalism and the territorial nation state. If you think of the history of the United States in the, at the end of the 19th century, you have that history of frontier. So what you have at the end of the 20th century in the Amazonia is a history of frontier not necessarily or not only the international borders, but the idea of frontiers, so of, uh, the idea of one uh, social entity, let's call nation, growing and catching the territory. Pan-Amazonia is experienced the effects of these driving forces. Due to the environmental turn, um, the way we understand Amazonia in relationship to globalization is, I think there is sort of a turn for simultaneity. We cannot just speak today of globalization in the Amazon, like international forces going to the Amazon region. No. Amazonia has become a global object. People in Tokyo or in Montreal or in South Africa have worked claiming, let's protect the Amazonia. Amazonia has become a global object. It's not just a region. Let's say, it's not the Cerrado Brasileño, it's not the Cerrado. Nobody, you don't see in the social media, nobody protesting for the destruction of the Cerrado. Nobody is protesting for the destruction of the Orinoquia, of Orinoquia. But everybody is protesting for the destruction of the Amazon. Amazonia has become a global object. So I would say there is a sort of combination from globalization in the Amazon and globalization of the Amazon. So Amazon becoming a global object in this period. Um, I will say that Amazon is experiencing new global transformation in the 21st century that is becoming or is changing the world because the center is moving from the west to the Pacific basin. Decades of continuous growth of China, Korea, Japan, the Tigers, Australia, California, and so on and so forth, and other countries in the Pacific basin. I, I was thinking with pedagogical reason I would like to exaggerate a little bit. The globalization of the 21st century will move completely from the year Eurocentric point of view of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century 